Right. Someone referred to this as a graveyard shift, which I thought, oh, that's not very nice. Uh, so not only have I been put in the graveyard shift, I've also been given the, the least amount of time of all speakers. Uh, not that I'm counting. Uh, I couldn't figure out whether or not to put a slide about who I am, because I was introducing this morning, but then I thought some people might have missed it because they drank too much. Uh, so I'm Colin Gillespie. I wrote a book that Liam hasn't read. Uh, <laughs> And I'm one of the co-founders of Jumping Rivers, uh, so Esther, who will be closing, is, is other co-founder, and also my wife. Data science, again, sorry for getting the same slide multiple times, but hey, uh, we basically do lots of R in data science, okay? So when, I, when we started the company, we thought we were doing lots of statistics, machine learning, and AI. What's actually happened is we're doing a lot of the stuff around that, you know, people tend to have data scientists in their organization, but they need help with all the bits in between. You know, so helping them take the, the, the shiny app to the next level, maybe authentication, maybe scaling it, maybe putting in CI, maybe doing testing, you know, all the bits around about that, that sort of, I suppose someone coming out with the domain knowledge doesn't know. So that's where we tend to help. Let's start on a pessimistic note because it's just after lunch. So security's hard, right? And I can prove that security's hard because I went to YouTube. So it's a 24th century, they can travel through time, and they still can't secure a database due to SQL injections, right? So just put, that's how hard this stuff is, right? Time travel, not a problem. SQL injections, you know, Postgres, my SQL is just beyond them. So that's where we're starting. And essentially what I'm going to, to talk about is we, we do sort of two services, well, we do lots of services, but two of the things we've been doing for the last couple of years so something called the Shiny Health Check and something called a, a sort of positive Shiny Server Health Check. So a Shiny Health Check is we get a Shiny app from a client and we look at the code structure and we look at the documentation and we look at how they deploy it. Uh, we look at accessibility, we look at security, we look at get set up and then we go through it. Clearly we've got a biased sample because we get very few people coming along with something absolutely perfect and we take a look at it and go, that's absolutely perfect. So, you know, it's a biased sample. And I'm just going to sort of talk about some of the things that, that we've come across. Okay. The first thing is, even that step one where the client gives us our, their app can be incredibly hard, right? You know, and that's always a, a sort of a, a warning flag of, we'd like you to look after, you know, have a look at our shiny app. Great. Can you give us access to it? Or can you give us a code? Or can you well, not really, you know, because it's got X, Y, and Z, you know, passwords are all over the place and it's connected. So that, that's part of the problem. Over the last year or two, we've had quite a few SQL injections. Uh, and essentially, if you don't know what an SQL injection is, it's basically when you're too trusting of the user input, right? You know, there's a little text box or there's a URL with a little question mark and essentially users never lie. And so the user types in something, you take that string and then you automatically pass it through. So there was one app, oh, to be fair, it wasn't quite a shiny app. Essentially, they, they took that user input, automatically fed it into an R Markdown document and just said, well, the user would never lie to us because users are nice people. Turns out that users can be bad, right? So that, that's, that's one thing that we've come across. I've tried to really, you know, when I've been messing about with shiny apps, shiny by itself does quite a good, way, you know, terms tends to sanitize your input. So sanitizing your input just means you can't just put in speech marks and speech marks gets automatically put through and doing horrible database things. You have to really go out your way to do something a bit dangerous. The another thing is reproducibility, right? So everybody loves reproducibility. Now imagine I said, I'm not going to bust into John Lennon, don't worry. Imagine I said that we never updo updated our web server. Oh, a WordPress site or a PHP version, right? You know, if you had anything like that, it's like, oh yeah, not updated WordPress. And well, to be honest, if you've not updated WordPress in days, it's probably been owned. But if you've not updated WordPress or PHP or your server, anything like that, you think that's just a bit dodgy. You know, you've got this application, you've got your website, it's running, it's your public face to the world, and you're not updating that stuff. You know, you should have a regular update. And quite often we come across shiny apps that are essentially exactly like that. You know, we have a shiny app 
and it's not been updated in a long time. But what do I mean? I mean, it's sort of the curse of reproducibility. You're sort of damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. And the same also applies to, I'm going to say, sort of VM with Python. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about Docker and a little bit about RENV, but they're sort of similar ideas, you know, you can you substitute. So Docker, in case you don't know what Docker is, it's imagine you can get a little box that contains your operating system and you can put your app in it. So you're pinning it to the operating system, you know, so you can say Ubuntu 2004, right? You know, so it's pinned and that part of the, the th your app stable. And then you've got RENV, and that's a way of capturing your packages that you're using. So you're building a, a Shiny app, and you say, what are packages am I using in my Shiny app? So you've got a whole list of packages captured. You've got all their uh, version numbers. You also capture that version. So it's a good idea, right? Clearly, this is a good thing. And if you don't use RNV in Docker or something similar, your users will cry because your apps will constantly get broken because packages will change and versions will change and everybody will be complaining. And software engineers will come in and say, ah, you've not done it right. You see, you should have been using Docker and you should be using RNV. And so, that's it. Your team will cry and they'll start fighting because they'll just point fingers at each other by saying, well, it worked for me, but it's your computer you've not set up. Have you tried updating your packages? Or, you know, so it's not good. And then you'll cry because your user teams are just going to be moaning all the time and your apps don't work either. So nobody's really winning. So you have to sort of use something like this. And the upside of using RENV in Docker is your OS, your operating system's frozen, you know, you've pinned to Ubuntu or whatever. You've got all your package versions are frozen, so that's pinned. And you've got your R versions frozen, so that's pinned, so that means we can work together. You know, I can give you my app, you can run my app, you've got all the stuff that's exactly like my app. The downside of using RNV and Docker is, well, the operation system's frozen, your package versions are frozen, and your R versions frozen as well, right? So the thing that we all want to use it's also a bit of a curse if you're not careful. Again, go back to that idea of WordPress. You know, WordPress is a thing that's getting hacked all the time. Right? You know, so you need to keep updating this over and over again. But yet we've got a Shiny app, so once it's there, it's perfectly fine. Even though we've got sensitive data, even though we've got JavaScript, even though we've got this, this, and this. Right? And it's not like a magic solution to this, other than you just need to keep things updated and making it part of your, your routine. And so quite often when we are looking at Shiny apps in this health check, they may or may not be using RNV. And when they are, quite often it's sort of pinned to something quite long ago. And the reason why they've not updated is because something breaks. And okay, I can understand that. You know, people have took deadlines. You know, your, your boss is wanting you to do something for tomorrow. But that just sort of gradually goes into days and weeks and months. And a lot of our packages, especially when we're talking about Shiny, have little bits of JavaScript in them. Now, on the bright side, lots, there's very few vulnerabilities. On the downside, it's nobody's really looked. So, you know, it's, it's where we go. So just sort of making sure that you're, you're keeping things up to date. Again, you can take a lot of pain and suffering out of this with some nice continuous integration, continuous deployment. So continuous integration would be, you've got your Git repo, so Git is just a way of storing your code. So you're pushing to Git, continuous integration can then run your current app, but then you can have another branch that's running something that's up to date. Right. GitHub hygiene. Uh, so here I'm thinking you're deploying to connect AWS, Azure, DigitalOcean or somewhere, and watch out for hard-coded secrets. Uh, so what do you mean by hard-coded secrets? So Liam sort of touched on this earlier on. We're thinking about things like passwords, usernames, and everything else. And you think, well, fine. Nobody would do that. Have you ever heard of Google Docking? Who's heard of Google Docking? Is that a cross? No? So you can go and Google Google Docking afterwards. Uh, and it uses Google Search to find security holes in configuration and computer code. Right? And this is as scary as it gets, because you essentially need zero technical knowledge to do this stuff. So if you do a quick Google of, a, you know, of Google Docs, I know it's now too many Googles in one sentence, you essentially come to pages with thousands of things. You know, if you search for this type of file and this string, you'll end up with people who have put their passwords on PHP. If you search for this and this and this, you'll end up with a bunch of your password file for MySQL if you search for this, this and this, and so on. Right? So it's a very 
low level way of just sort of getting Google to do your attack, you know, just search the world, please. All right. And in case you think I'm, I'm making this up, you know, if you go to GitHub and search for something like path.renv, so it's an R environment file, and search for the word token, uh, one or two people will, will pop up where they've put tokens in the RENV and then committed to GitHub. And I thought quite long and hard about putting this up here. So I thought, that's bad. You know, you're, you're sort of telling people. I can guarantee you that people are already scanning GitHub for anything starting with the word dot, because that's sort of a, a config file, and something like token and key or, or whatever else. Right? You know, it's not that hard. So this will already be happening of people going into GitHub, GitLab, scanning for anything starting with the dot, because you've automatically got a config file, doing a quick grep for the words token, key, auth, that sort of stuff. And all of a sudden, you get a whole bunch of stuff. And that's quite easy to do. Uh, there are less obvious searches you can use, and I'm not going to tell you the less ob obvious searches you can use. Uh, if you're going down this route, just be aware of the words illegal, police, don't do it, right? So just be careful. But yeah, you know, that, that's something that comes up. Uh, how would we get around this? So there, what, what we do at Jumping Rivers is whenever we set up a GitLab or a GitHub account, we've automatically got a templated git ignore file. So a git ignore file is a little file that says, on no circumstances, unless you try really, really, really hard, can you commit these files? And so then you can list a bunch of standard files. So when we create a repo, we've automatically got that in with a whole bunch of things just to avoid this stuff. Right? It's not foolproof, but it happens. So have that git ignore, make it part of the default so you can configure GitHub and GitLab to automatically add those sorts of things in so then users don't have to remember to add them because we all make silly mistakes. We also do a bunch of uh, sort of connection and health checks. So I'm now moving from looking at the application code to looking at the server code. Okay, so that's the thing that George was sort of touching on this morning. Uh, so we're looking at configuration, server setup, efficiency, uh, deployments, risk assessment, security, all that sort of stuff. So essentially what happens is we work with a client, they say, look, we've got a shiny server, or connect, can you take a look at it just to see, does it work? Again, as you might imagine, it's like a bit of a biased sample because no one comes to us saying, everything works wonderfully well, can you take a look? It doesn't happen. So the big thing that people tend not to do is sort of mind the headers, right? So what do I mean by that? So when you visit a website, so it's my little dashboard, and I'm Chrome, and remember, a shiny app's a web page too, and so is Quarto and R Markdown documents, so all these things are web pages. Uh, we would say to the website, well, I'm wanting to go to jumpingrivers.com, that's a host, I'm wanting to look at the page consultancy, and I've got the user agent Chrome, and then the web page will say something like, oh, thank you very much. So that top line, the 200, I don't know if you're you know, familiar with 404, it's a port page not found, 200 is everything's happy, here's something you've asked for. We've got a little bit of content type, we've got a little bit, you know, so those are headers, right? The, the scent before we get into the real meat of the page. And typically, but not always, you might have, I'm going to say, a, a proper server in front of your, your, your shiny server. Not always, but, you know, something like Nginx or Apache or Caddy, you know, so these are sort of really production ready servers that are used by major websites all around the world, you know, so you might have that in front of Shiny. Not always, but that, that's typically what happens. And essentially what I'm going to be talking about is adding things to the server level. So when someone visits your Shiny app, the server's already told them a whole bunch of stuff just to, to either look out for or not to do or just to block entirely, all right? And so essentially we're trying to stop the, the shiny developer, i.e. us, from doing something they perhaps didn't mean to. So first thing I'm going to talk about is cross-site uh, cross scripting, so CSP's content security policy. Okay. So why do you want content security policy? So a content security policy is a header that you you'd set in your server. And, dear me, it's five minutes already. Uh, content security is a, a header you set in your, your server, and it's basically saying, when you're loading my web page, you're only allowed to, to include content from here, here, and here. Right? Any other content is blocked. Right? So you're allowed to include content from posit, but you're not allowed to include content from over here. Right? So it's blocked at the server level. Right? 
So that means if someone came in and started messing about with your app, it, you've been saved. You can also add in things like, okay, I'm going to load in this bit of JavaScript from jumpingrivers.com, right? So um, I'm pulling in JavaScript from an external site, but something might happen, so I can hash that JavaScript, so I'm going to load it in, provided it's not changed, right? So if you're pulling in things. So if you look at your Shiny app, you know, so for most complicated Shiny apps, you're pulling JavaScript from left, right, and center, right? All those quizzy little animations tend to come from somewhere. So there's lots of external JavaScripts going on. And so essentially, you know, what I'm thinking about is you might have a, a little bit in your web page saying script equals some site slash script.javascript. And here I've got stuff as a technical term. So the content security policy provides you a mechanism for saying you're only allowed to add in stuff from these sites here. Here's a bunch of, of sites in the layer list. And it looks a little bit like this. Essentially, we've got adding in an extra line right at the bottom. So all that's saying is when you're loading this web page, you're only allowed to load in stuff from your own domain, jumping rivers, and here, pause it. Anything else gets blocked. If you added in just now, your app would just break because you've got stuff from all over the place. Other things that's useful, another head in this was quite easy to add in, is strict secu transport security. So what happens here is you're going to Jumping Rivers. When you type in jumpingrivers.com in the browser, what happens is the browser automatically thinks you've got HTTP. That's just the way the web works, right? And so the browser will go, oh, I think you meant HTTPS. And you go, oh, you're right, I did mean HTTPS. Right, so it's all very nice. But those two times at the start, you are transmitting data unencrypted. Right? And what HTT, oh, what is STS does is it basically enforces SSL from the start. Right? So it's a little flag you can set on your server, and it's the first time you visit a site, it sets a, a little flag saying, whenever you contact this site again, it must be over SSL. Right? Again, thinking about your, you know, chatting with people in the, the room, you come from some organisations who are right to be paranoid, to be honest. You know, farmers, governments, dealing with patient data, dealing with client data. You know, there's a lot of, you know, Security is a big thing. So even though this is like, oh, who cares? Well, depending on your risk and how much people are out to get you, this might be something you want to think about. And it's quite easy to add in. Last one, uh, referrer policy. This controls what is sent. Again, this is sort of a one-line thing that someone, just to be clear, this is what you set in the server. So this would be your sysadmin. Uh, and essentially, this is what you're, you're transmitting, right? So let's imagine jumpingrivers.com slash secret link. So that's the web page I currently am on. Right? So we're developing a top secret project that we don't want anyone to know about. I think, don't be silly. Well, that's probably true. But you might be a, you know, might be a pharmaceutical company and you're developing uh, a new drug. You know, so the URL contains something about the drug. You might be something in finance and you've got a list of companies that you're, you're thinking of you know, purchasing or buying shares in or, or something like that. And so the destination here is example. And then the referrer is the thing that I'm going to send. So currently I'm in Jumping Rivers. I click on example, what do I tell example about where I've been, right? So we can set it to say, let's tell example.com nothing at all. It's like we've just magically appeared, right? We're masters of disguise. Let's tell jumpingrivers.example.com uh, that we've come from gr.com, right? We'll give them a little bit of information, you know, the domain, but nothing else. Or we could add in the full thing. So again, that's a sort of trivial little, th not trivial, an easy little thing that you can just add in in the server. And depending on where you are, that could be really important. Right? Especially if you're from, you know, URLs can contain some important information. So, summary, I'm going to say, don't stress it's shiny, it's like other stuff. Not 100% true, but actually it's more the other stuff that's more likely now experienced to, to give you issues. You know, it's not configured web servers. It's, you know, not thinking about where JavaScript's coming in. It's using old packages. It's, you know, hard coding secrets. And none of them are sort of shiny per se. They're just sort of part of the whole, you know, you're developing a web app. Uh, run a little package. So jumpingrivers.com, you know, it's in GitHub slash server headers. You can put your URL and it'll give you back a bunch of server headers and tell you what's been displayed. And there's lots of other server headers out there. So we just tried to give you sort of the the six or seven that people think are, are sensible to set. Uh, need to help get in touch, you know, either by chatting with me afterwards or by grabbing someone later on. So thank you very much, and I think I've finished in time.